So he called me when I was walking out of physics class and I picked up the phone and he wasn't talking, he was just crying. And I was like, what in the world is happening? I just heard him, you know, crying on the phone and he said, um, I have prostate cancer. So that experience really kicked off my passion towards understanding what was going on with him. But beyond when he was diagnosed, I started to notice that black men in our community were being diagnosed. It was just something I hadn't noticed before. So I'm like, oh wow, well, this person at church has it. Oh wow, this person at the grocery store has it. It was just different men were getting prostate cancer like in their 40s and 50s. Like it was um, younger than what I would have thought. I learned from watching him like go through his surgery and his radiation and you know, seeing his medications and things and that he was on just I didn't realize like how private prostate cancer can be. And I really have like never even talked to him about this. So dad, don't get mad when you watch. But um, I noticed like it was almost like there's issues that come up that maybe men would be embarrassed about. So that was the first time I saw it with him. Now that, you know, I worked with a lot of men that have had prostate cancer, hundreds, you know, it, that's a, like a common theme. Like, of course, men, they're scared of certain treatments. They don't want to have the side effects and, um, and they don't necessarily feel comfortable talking to people. They feel isolated sometimes, you know? And so that was something that was like the first time where I saw my dad be like, I guess not be such a superhero that he was more, he became more human in that moment, you know, Absolutely. that he was embarrassed maybe or um, nervous. I wasn't used to seeing him like that. So this is something that infuriates me for sure. I've also published on this. So first of all, in Southern California, where I live at, um, we did a study looking at over 400 men and found that 54% of black men, their doctors had never even talked to them about prostate cancer screening. So we have to start with that. Like a lot of men are not even getting screened when they should. So that is because prostate cancer screening recommendations for a while, um, we're saying, okay, screen every man at 50. And then 2012, the US Preventive Task Force said, we're not screening men at 50 anymore. The problem is that really hurt black men. And the, that recommendation was based off of studies that um, tested 200, looked at 200,000 men not have prostate cancer. They uh, had t done the PSA test to see if it was indicative that they would get prostate cancer in the future. But the studies only had, I don't want to say only, but over 95% were men of European ancestry. So there was this recommendation that was applied to everyone, but it didn't take into consideration that there's racial difference in um, prostate cancer risk. And so you have a problem if you have a black man that's going to the doctor and they're in their 40s and American Cancer Society and Prostate Cancer Foundation says, listen, if you're black and you're 45, you need to get your PSA tested. If you're black and you have family members that have prostate cancer, you need to get tested at 40. This is the recommendation. Um, and then you go to the doctor and your doctor says, actually, no, you don't need to be screened. That happens so many times. <laughs> so of course, if you go to the doctor and the doctor says you don't need a test, who wants to get the test? You're just like, okay, I'm good. I don't need to get the test. <laughs> There's differences in how those numbers should, should translate based on race. And so for a while, um, the number that men would look, at, would look at with their physicians is a number of four. So four nanograms per milliliters of your, of your PSA. If it's higher than four, then maybe you, know, you wanna do some follow-up. Well, it's actually 2.5 for black men, according to American Cancer Society. And um, my boss, Dr. Rick Kittles has published that actually you can look at numbers of 1.5 in black men and it can be predictive years down the road that that is going to transform into prostate cancer. And so, you know, a PSA of 14 <laughs> is quite alarming, you know, and then by the time he was diagnosed, it was, it was 64 um, is my remembrance of it, but it's been a long time ago. So, so yeah, you go to the doctor, you have an elevated PSA, you have a high Gleason, and I can't tell you how many times where I've had people reach out to me and they'll say, hey, you know, my Gleason score is seven and my doctor says that I should do watchful waiting. And I say, do they look at you? Do they know that you're black? <laughs> like, do they get the memo? 
I love working with on clinical trials because to me, clinical trials, how I try to explain it to people, it's like a VIP access to a cutting edge treatment. And so a lot of people can be afraid of clinical trials because you know you might think that you're gonna be a guinea pig, we have that mentality. Um, there's a lot of mistrust in clinical trials in the black community for sure. Um, you know, number one, because of the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, you know, that was just a trial gone completely wrong for 40 years. Um, and so there's a lot of mistrust about clinical trials and who's funding it and who's behind it and am I going to be a guinea pig and, and am I going to get a placebo? A lot of people have um, an idea that they're going to get a placebo. Well, at, when all actuality, if you participate in a clinical trial, you are um, either going to get standard of care, which would be what you know is offered in the clinic to anybody that would have your particular disease, but you also have the option where you may get the VIP treatment on top of the standard of care or in place of the standard of care. And it doesn't, that the VIP drugs don't get to that stage, you know, like that. It's like years and years and years in the making. So by the time it's to that point, we in, as scientists and physicians, you know, feel very confident that this is going to work, which is why it's to the point where it's in a clinical trial. So um, it, first of all, increasing the number of minority physicians in general would help. But what we like to do um, in addition to that is to have a diverse team as well. So, and that's diversity in terms of um, race, but also gender, also age, also um, occupation. You know, we have the physicians, we have the nurses, we have the scientists. And a lot of us that work within the Division of Health Equities at City of Hope have personal ties to how we even got into this. You know, I got into this because of my dad. And so when I'm speaking to black men who, you know, and they're saying, oh, you know, I feel fine. I don't have any symptoms. Well, really, because my dad didn't have any symptoms either, you know. Oh, I don't, I don't know if I get that done. You know, I'm not going to have a normal life. No, you haven't, you know, my dad had that and he's doing great. You know, so we all that work on these teams have personal ties. And so it comes across as more genuine for sure. And so I hope that really changes like moving um, forward, being more open to sharing because I know like in my family and my husband's family, like prostate cancer is not limited to one person, you know, it's, it's rampant. And so the more you talk about it and the more you normalize, like, listen, this runs in the family, you want to get um, tested earlier. I think we're so close. And when I got into this, when my dad was sick, I said, his doctor told him at that time, um, you know, oh, you have a set amount of years. So he's passed that amount of years, you know, and he's he's doing well. We, we know he's not, he's not curable still, you know, but um, I hope to change that. So I, when I got into this, I was like, I'm gonna find a cure for my dad. So I'm just like, dad, hold on, just hold on. We're at the cusp of it. So, um, I do think that it's around the corner. I don't think that it's something that's like decades away. I was in science before I got cancer, right? So like my dad had cancer, I was in science. Then I was walking around with cancer for six months myself. And you know, and then I had to do chemo in the whole nine yards. And so after that, it just completely changed my thought process and my approach. It changed my outlook on life, first of all. So everything became urgent. Everything I do, I don't know that I'll be here tomorrow.